How's everybody? Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Fabulous. Yeah. All that good stuff. Outstanding. Yeah. All right. I'm good too. I'm good too. I, I uh, spent the last few days with some good friends of mine up in Mammoth Lakes, California. And when you when I say God's good. It was storming so bad on Monday and Tuesday yeah. in Memphis, they had to close the mountain. That's a bad boy. But when we got ready to ski Wednesday morning, bright sunshine, tons of snow. I mean, you could have asked for a better day to enjoy the divine that we got on that mountain. Just amazing. And you could just imagine a bunch of senior citizens. <laughs> <laughs> These old brothers, you know, Ben Philly, eight years old. We, we saw that mountain. Tell them, we had a good time. You might catch John on Facebook. You know, he had to put his stuff on Facebook. You saw it. You saw it. You saw it. Yeah, but we had it. We had a wonderful time. We I mean, really did. Uh, that's the good thing we always do to celebrate my, my birthday. So we get close. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. So, we, 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 we enjoy the divine love of God. But I want to start out by just acknowledging a couple of uh, a couple of folks. You know, Patti LaBelle sings a song that's one of my favorite tunes. And the name of that song is Love Never Dies. Did y'all hear that song? Yes. How many of you believe that divine love never dies? Okay. Okay. All right. When I asked the question this morning, I said, how many of them believe that love never dies? And a couple of comments. <laughs> they were talking about that other love that we you know, changed every other day. <laughs> so I had to ask the right divine love. And because we know divine love never dies, and we know that when someone moves into that next dimension or that makes their transition, it's an extension of life. Because love never dies. So we want to dedicate what we do today to some folk who recently made that transfer. Uh, Dr. Ann Rice, who was one of the original board members of Hearthside, made her transition this past week. Yesterday we held services for one of our dearest members, Cecilia Kerr, right here, yeah. who made her transition last week. Uh, Adeline Booster, whose daughter was the head of LA Unified, made her transition uh, recently. And uh, the young lady that takes care of me, Reverend Lisa Shannon, here, where you at? Where's your name? Uh, she lost her category in a car accident uh, this past week. So we want to dedicate what we're doing today to those spirits that are living beyond our expectations. Because if you've already said, divine love never dies. Reverend Lisa has done everything she can to make you aware of the fact that when you say something is divine, we mean that that something is in the nature of God. When we speak the word love, we know that love is the pure essence of God's being, which is all that there is and all that there will ever be. Charles Fillmore, which is someone who has given me so much enlightenment, I, I just can't tell you. You guys always talk about how we give a metaphysical interpretation of this book here. That all comes from Charles Fillmore, not from me. I'll just give it to you. And Charles Fillmore says this. He says, of all the attributes of God, love is the power that joins, binds, and harmonizes the universe and everything in it. Do I need to say that again? Yeah. Of all the attributes of God, love is the power that joins, binds, and harmonizes the universe and everything in it. Divine love is a person. It just loves for the sake of love. It has nothing else to do and doesn't know how to do anything else. Divine love will bring you 
should I say, divine love will bring your own to you. Now what does that mean? It means divine love will bring whatever it is you desire, whatever it is you require, for yourself and others. If you lead with the consciousness of divine love, the world is your oyster. There's nothing unlimited in this world. Everything, I should say, is unlimited when you lead with divine love. Divine love will adjust our misunderstandings. That's right, Robert. It'll adjust the misunderstanding. You're going to have some misunderstandings in this life. There's going to be some things and some people that ain't going to do what you want them to do when you want them to do it. They're not going to come from the exact same space that you're coming from at the time you happen to come from that space. Yes. But if you look at the situation <laughs> through the lens of divine love, it will adjust that misunderstanding. When you adjust your attitude, when you adjust the misunderstanding, that makes all of your life affairs healthy, happy, harmonious, and most of all, free. Yeah. We celebrate freedom this month. This is Black History Month, right? Yeah. We're going to give you some stuff about that. We have a nice presentation coming for you after I get to talk. Revelation. She told you last week that thought consciousness, what you think, determines your experiences. So it doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter what happened. It doesn't matter what's happening now or what's going to happen later. It all starts with your thoughts. What you create here has to happen here. Once that idea is embedded into the soul, it must produce. It has no choice. It must produce. I frequently remind you that it's not what happens, but it's your perception that brings you either joy or sorrow in that situation. So it doesn't matter whether you hit the lottery or whether you experience a tragic accident. The joy or sorrow that comes from that is based on your perception of that incident. Ernest Holmes says it this way. He says, thought is creative. We cannot say that one thought will create while another one will not. All thought is creative according to the emotion, the conviction, or impulse that you put behind. So the results that you're experiencing are based on the emotion that you put behind. The conviction that you have towards whatever it is you're trying to achieve. And the impulse, meaning the way you respond to that situation. Remember Lisa said, don't react. Respond to the situation. You see, the soul is creative intelligence. It's the law of God at work. That's why she directed us to chapter 4, the soul. God is law and love. Law is love, and love is love. Here's the good news. We are not servants to the law. We are recipients of the love that God, through law, desires to express through us as us. I said we are not servants. We're not robots. We are recipients. We have to receive God's divine love. We're recipients of the love that God, through the law, through the soul, desires to express through us as us. Now, Jesus kind of simplified things. He gave us two commandments that encompasses all the others. The 613 all that the Jews had, or the 10 that Moses went up to the mountain and brought back down. 
He told us to love God with all our heart and soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. And the scripture that we want to teach from today, which kind of encompasses divine love and that presentation of loving God with all your heart and soul and loving your neighbor as yourself, is Romans 13, 8 through 10. This is what Paul tells Romans. He says, Owe no man anything but love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law, which says, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is fulfilled in this saying. Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love does not work evil to his name because love <clears throat> is the fulfillment of the law. Divine love. I hate these new caps. <laughs> it needs something to screw up. You know? What that scripture is telling us it's telling us to own nobody anything. Meaning, don't hold anything against anybody and don't accept anybody holding anything against you. Give every person his or her just due, brother. That's all you have to do. You talked about it earlier. Give every person his or her just due. Treat each other fairly respectfully and just. By doing this, we will keep the commandments that Moses brought from a higher level of state of consciousness down to us so we can understand. He said, thou shalt not kill. Now I know most of you are thinking to yourself, that's probably the easiest commandment in the world to keep. I'm not going to hurt nobody. None of you, I hope, have ever even had a thought of taking someone's life from them. Thou shalt not kill, therefore, appears to be a very easy commandment to keep for most people. But I want to remind you of something. This book is a book of spiritual understanding. It's not a book of literal directives. You see, thou shall not kill means that you can commit murder every time you express hate towards somebody else. So before you were sitting there thinking, I don't have to worry about that. Now that you know that murder is expressing hate towards your brother, you still got the same attitude? There's not Many of us sitting in this room, truth be told, that have not expressed hate towards their brother or their sister. You see, you commit murder every time you keep someone from expressing their best life. If you're taking something from them that keeps them from expressing the life that God gave them to express, you're taking them. 1 John 3 and 15 makes it clear. These words came out of the master's mouth. He says, he who hates his brother is a murderer and has no eternal life abiding in him. What he's telling you is that if you're void of the divine love of Jesus within you, then you're capable of hating someone, therefore you're capable of committing the next one he points to in the scripture is, do not commit adultery. Whenever I throw that one out, you folk get nervous. <laughs> but what he's telling us is, don't mix 
truth with error. He's telling us to avoid the lustful consciousness that results in the sin of error thinking. See, committing adultery has less to do with cheating on your spouse than it does cheating on yourself. Then he says, don't steal. Because every time you take from others, you're limiting yourself. If you take from somebody else, you're truly robbing yourself. He reminds us not to covet, which is simply telling us to stop being selfish, greedy, and stingy. Oh, I agree. None of y'all. <laughs> Ain't nobody in here self. No. Never been. Ain't nobody in here stingy. No. Wouldn't loan me $2 if I needed it. <laughs> How about greedy? Anybody ain't got more than you need and won't give nobody else enough? Huh? Yeah. What they say, huh? <laughs> what that scripture wants us to understand is God is an inexhaustible storehouse. Your spiritual riches come from within, not from other folk. Divine love does no ill to anyone. More than enough. There's more than enough divine love to go around. So divine love will keep your consciousness clear of all the thoughts that do harm to others. Divine love moves us to a state of helpfulness. Divine love will help those who are lost. It will help those who have gone astray. It will help those who are feeling hopeless. Divine love will direct you back to your spiritual profession. Divine love leads you out of the wilderness of undisciplined thoughts. Divine love reacquaints you with the Christ's presence of faith, hope, and charity. Divine love will turn your thoughts of error into ideas of spiritual truth. Whatever it is for the present, Whatever you do for the ultimate good of self and others is within the scope and power of divine love. See, when you express that agape love, that unconditional love, you qualify for residence in the kingdom of truth. The spirit of divine love is your ticket to a heavenly experience. Ernest Holmes in chapter 4, which Reverend Lisa asked you to take a look at, he says, spirit of divine love is key. It's the key to everything. The spirit of divine love is key. The soul is the servant of spirit. The soul is the servant of spirit. Remember I told you, oh, you guys had choices. Yeah. Up here you got choices. Down here, you don't have choice. Whatever you think here that seeds in here, this got to come out. It's got to happen. Just the way that you put it in. The soul is a subjective intelligence. It's a principle just beneath spirit. It's a blind force. It doesn't know anything, but it does everything. But Ernest Holmes says we have to be careful not to confuse the soul, that intelligent spirit, with soul stuff. Soul stuff is different, you know. Soul stuff is that undifferentiated substance of ideas from which things are made. But that soul stuff is not necessarily spiritual stuff. Because we plant that soul stuff for ourselves. In New Thought, we call it race consciousness. That's all the stuff you've been carrying around ever since somebody did something bad to you. I was watching a movie last night, the, 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 the story of Antoine Fisher. Y'all yeah. remember that movie? Yes. Now you talking about somebody's soul being full of soul stuff. This brother experienced every mistreatment known to man. Yet, through the help of Denzel Washington, <laughs> he was able to work through it. 
and raise his conscience above the level of degradation. If you think black folks in America have been treated bad, read his story. There's nothing that escaped him. If you can imagine as a child being victimized in a way, he was victimized in that way. So when those things happen to us, that's where the soul stuff comes from. And we have to be mentally elevated. We have to be exposed to divine love of self, which Denzel Washington did as the psychiatrist in the movie, in order to move him above all of that soul stuff that he was carrying around and was causing him to hit everybody that said anything to him. Y'all know kids like that in school. Always want to fight. Always in trouble. Always getting sent to the principal's office. And you thought they were just bad kids. You didn't know that they might not have had nothing to eat that morning, wasn't going to get nothing to eat that night, and mom and daddy was doing things to them that you wouldn't do to a dog. Mm -hmm. If they had a mom and daddy, it might have been foster mom and daddy. Mm -hmm. So that soul stuff is a little different. Mm -hmm. But whatever you consciously think into your soul, good or bad, will manifest as an element in your life experience. The soul is a universal presence in which we all live, and it's everywhere present. Our future <coughs> depends on our nature. In our nature, the name we call forth, that restorative power within, that Christ consciousness, you see, it's in the name of Jesus that we call forth the law of God. In the spirit of Christ, we demonstrate the love of God in mind, body, and soul. The law or soul must be constantly seeded by the mind that's baptized in divine love in order for the body to reveal its spiritual truth. Divine love is the fulfillment of spiritual love. But in our humanness, we forget how much we are beloved by God. We forget that we are the beloved of God. So Ralph, to answer your question, it's always there. It never leaves you. You just forget sometimes mm -hmm. that divine love is the essence of you. You see, as we noted in our scripture that we read earlier, Romans 13, we often forget our divinity and focus on our sensual pleasures. We focus on material gain. We focus on domination and control of others. We lose sight of the divine love that created us. And when that happens, we need what they call a redo. We need a do-over. We need an opportunity to reconcile with ourselves. Now this is Black History Month, and I said we're going to have a presentation on Black History immediately following what I have to say to you today. But you know, everything's in these books. And there's a story in the Bible that was misinterpreted and misunderstood. And because it was misinterpreted and misunderstood by some and saw as a means to take advantage by others, it was you to plant that seed of oppression amongst those of you who are dark in complexion. You see, ironically, the misunderstanding of this surrounds this story, it ignited a series of events which created an opportunity for us to even have to celebrate black history, which in truth is white history. A story of affirmation, a story of baptism of the mind, the body, and the soul that helped create a story or reality in this country of separation and oppression. We all know Noah's story. We all know that y'all was out of control. That there was so much hatred going on, so much misuse of God's law going on in this universe that God said, we got to do a redo. We're going to have to wrap this up and start all over again. Good friend of mine is made it his uh, New Year's resolution to read the Bible from cover to cover. So we met for lunch not long ago uh, 
town next very good friend of mine. He said, I'm reading the Bible from cover to cover. And I'm on the story of Noah. And he says, Reverend Drew, I just can't see how any of that could really happen, literally. How many people do you think in this world really believe that all of that happened, literally? And I said, I can't give you a number. But I can tell you how many people go to church on a regular basis in these United States of America. 23% go to church once a week. But I said, Tom, it doesn't matter whether it happened little or didn't. What matters is what thought you took from the story that you apply to your life. See, this story symbolizes what's necessary for the unfolding was necessary for the recapturing of God's original idea of man. The body temple as an eternal dwelling place for the soul. All the negative thoughts contrary to God's purpose had to be washed away. So Noah, being the one person that was singled out, that was resting in God, that still had a spark of God's divinity within him, was told to build a ship. Build this ark so your family could experience the baptism of spirit necessary to establish order and equality in the three states of consciousness, the mind, the body, and the soul, which are identified by his sons. Two of every living thing had to be placed in this spiritual consciousness, meaning we have to be what? Married to things that appear to be opposite. We have to be balanced in ego and emotion and wisdom and love. We have to come together even though it looks like we're at odds, it looks like we're different. Somehow we have to mesh this thing together if we really want to be spiritually fulfilled. They say it rained like it's raining outside now for 40 days and 40 nights. 40 represents all the trials and all the tests that we have to go through in order for this redo to be accomplished. The number four represents unlimited freedom of action that allows us to have a new creation and zero represents the unlimited capacity of action which is our infinite possibilities. Day and night is understanding and lack of understanding we experience when we're trying to establish our truth. It said that Noah lived for 600 years, meaning he established a bunch of degrees in spiritual unfoldment. It takes time, you know, to get rid of the negative emotions and come up with, come through all these different trials and all these different tribulations. Seven is the number of spiritual law fulfillment. They say that this ark rested on the seventh month against Mount Ararat. Which means it resisted, it rested, I should say, in a state of consciousness high above the physical plane of understanding. This scripture symbolizes a change in consciousness from negative to positive. When we discover the indwelling Christ within us, when we accept the Savior, we are raised out of that atom consciousness to a consciousness of divine love. And once we're exposed to the Christ consciousness, after the covenant with God is established, then and only then can we experience divine love. If we are obedient to God's original instruction, meaning if all we did was express divine love, we won't be flooded with negative conditions. The move upon the water expressed capacity, meaning the potential for new ideas. The cleansing of the sense consciousness so we can have more spiritual knowing. And once we gain that spiritual knowing, we're able to do what Scripture tells us. He told Noah and his family to do what? Go forth and multiply. So when Noah got off the ark, the Bible tells us that the very first thing he did was plant a vineyard. Think about that now. You've been on this ark all this time. First thing you do is grow some wine. <laughs> See, wine represents spiritual vitality. So the first thing Noah wanted to do was create an atmosphere where spiritual vitality would come amongst all the people. But what did Noah do? 
The scripture says he got drunk. Mm -hmm. The scripture says that instead of using that wine for spiritual vitality, he took that substance that was intended for spiritual growth and he misused it for physical pleasure. He gave his attention to the cultivation of an earthly consciousness rather than a spiritual one. The Bible says that he became naked, which means he lost his garment of truth, meaning he was intoxicated with error thought. Like Noah, we all need to regain access to our new spiritual life. And occasionally, we need to be contaminated by our sense consciousness. There's not one of us in here, Ralph, can answer your question. It doesn't fall short of the mark, usually on a daily basis. There's a moment in time when you forget about divine love, and you're only thinking about your love and what you want at the time. But the scripture tells us that when Noah lost himself and was standing there naked, remember he had three boys. Shem, Japheth, and Ham. Ham was the baby boy. He was the one they said looked like y'all look. <laughs> Ham, being a part of his ignorance, a part of his sense thinking, he didn't help his father. As a matter of fact, he ridiculed and teased and poked fun at his father. He demonstrated that you can't get spiritual life out of material thoughts. But Shem and Japheth, they had pity and compassion for their father. So they say they covered him up. They covered up his nakedness. Meaning they weren't judging by appearances. They didn't see what was happening as reality. They saw the spiritual part of their father as whole, healthy, and complete. And when Noah with the help of his two older sons, got himself together. The very first statement out of his mouth was that the descendants of Ham must remain servants to Shem and Jacob. Noah's sons. Shem represents the spiritual, brilliant, realm, upright, and spiritual thinking. Japheth represents the intellect without limitation, that law that we call soul. And Ham, y'all, almost y'all, in Hebrew, represents cured or blackened, meaning that you're physically given to sensuality. And as instructed by God, they multiplied, they had sons, and I won't go through all the sons, but one of the sons that, that, that Shem had was Elam, and Elam represents the fully developed spiritual power that uncovers the truth. One of Jacob's sons, Gomer, represents human reasoning at the highest level, the, 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 the illumined spirit of intellect and imagination. And then there's Ham. He gave birth to Cush, which represents dark thinking, never a perception of truth. He also had a boy named Canaan that represents our fleshly driven tendencies. But here's what Noah was saying when he said that Ham would have to be a servant to Shem and Jacob. Noah was declaring that dark thinking must be the servant of a consciousness that exalts spiritual truth. He was saying that our physical desires must be humble and be receptive to spiritual truth. He was saying that our intellectual knowing must unite with our spiritual quality, that your physical consciousness must be exalted to a spiritual understanding. You see, Ham needed to be under the influence needed to be under the guidance and direction of his older brothers, Jacob and Shem. That's what Noah said when he got himself together. But these folk, or shall I say those folk, who were in control of all the resources at the time that the story got told, 
who had the power over disseminating information to the masses. With the help of what my good friend and Google Chancellor would call some jack leg preachers, <laughs> they told the world that God cursed him and turned him black. That the dark one was a slave to his body senses, therefore we had the right to make all dark and slaves to those who remained pure and white. <laughs> Some of y'all believed it. Oh, you did. You may not have believed it outwardly, but you believed it inwardly. If that wasn't true, you wouldn't hear nigga every time a rapper that comes up. They believed that you were unworthy, you were unfit. And while you was believing that, they were believing that they had every right as a good Christian to keep you on the side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about divine love, that's not your side track. What this story is, it's a story of divine love. It's a story of redemption. It's a story of an affirmation that became a lie of domination and suppression due to a lack of spiritual understanding, due to someone taking some literal words and using it to their advantage. Thank God the Bible is a book of spiritual understanding. Thank God that this book is based on a belief in one power called many names consume many different cultures and is prayed to in many different languages. The divine love that can't hurt or oppress anyone is what these scriptures are all about. And understanding that the living being are in truth an expression of God's divine love. Now this Thursday, we're going to celebrate a different kind of love. It's Valentine's Day, I ain't forgot. <laughs> right, right, she's sleeping. <laughs> I'm trying to get my brownie points in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, Thursday, we're going to celebrate the physical expression of love. Now, this holiday came about, there's all kinds of stories about what Valentine's Day is all about. Some of us say it's a pagan celebration that was Christianized later when the Romans used to round all the women up in the village and put them in the village town and the guys would come and pick one and that's who their girlfriend would be for that year. You know, that's, that's, that's some of the stories. Some of us say it's about St. Valentine who was executed for demonstrating divine love for helping Christian slaves escape Roman domination. Instead of, he, he, he let them go, he, he, he made families out of them and got them to end marriage, which is something that, you know, ultimately was illegal for y'all to do. <laughs> Our love for one another can and should be expressed on Valentine's Day. It can be expressed in diamonds. <laughs> she woke up. <laughs> or just gestures of affection. And I want all of you to make sure that you use Valentine's Day as a symbol of love and express it to all those around you and all those you care about and even those you don't know. But while you're doing that, I want you to remember this. That God has a way of turning pagan rituals into celebrations of his idea of romance and brotherly and divine love. Demonstrate your love on Valentine's Day. But I want you to remember God's greatest gift. That's divine love. God's greatest gift is agape love. Make the crooked way straight. That can only be done with divine love. Divine love is the only thing that can 
reveal the hidden truth of yourself within you. Divine love is the only power that can turn water into wine, can turn your potential into your spiritual reality. Divine love is the only power that can take a whole bunch of people and feed them with just two fish committed together in matrimony, meaning the ideas of spiritual unity into an unlimited supply of love for everybody. Jesus taught the principles of divine love. He said divine love, only God's love is unconditional. He said divine love is only God's love is universal. He said divine love is only God's love is perfect. And by the grace of that divine love, by the grace of that perfect love, by the grace of that universal love, by the grace of that unconditional love, we come into this world. We come into this world attached to the umbilical cord of that grace. And that's the place where we first touch God. The only thing worth teaching is how to recover our original center. The process of suffering and the process of love is how we unlearn our way back to God. I said the process of whatever it is you're going through, good or bad, that process only exists for you to unlearn all the stuff that's keeping you down. All the stuff that's keeping you from expressing the divine love that created you. The only thing that's blocking your blessing is you. Because if you live, if you breathe, if you think, if you desire, if you commit to it all, you give this divine love, you will have everything you need as soon as you need it. So if you're missing something, and I think everybody in here got something they want, a little bit of something that you need. There's somebody you want to do better. There's somebody you want to love more. There's somebody you want to appreciate you more. The only way to get it done is by embodying Meditating on, sleeping with, eating with, drinking with, divine love. Yeah. Saturate yourself with that. Yeah. If you saturate your mind, if you saturate your soul and your body with divine love, you're going to end up being the one yes. that experiences God's divine love. God bless you. Yeah.